Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Jesus, he was intentional. He spent time with the poor. He called up the outcast. He gave up his ministry to who society called unqualified. Jesus, he was generous. He healed the sick. He fed the poor. He helped others and ultimately gave his life for ours. Let's learn how to be intentional and generous with our lives and follow the example of Jesus. For you, welcome online. If you're joining us, we're glad that you're, uh, that you're part of this. And uh, my name is Andy Mead. I'm one of the, uh, the teaching pastors. As you can tell, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm fine, but it's more painful for you than it is for me, I can, I can assure you. But if you can uh, tolerate my voice, I do feel like I wanted to share a story with you. Uh, I want you to pretend with me, okay? So I want you to pretend <clears throat> a couple things. Number one, I want you to pretend that you don't know very much about the Bible. Now, for some of you, that's not a, a, that's not a big jump. You think, okay, I'm, I'm pretty much there. Others of you, that, that you have to really pretend a lot, right? I don't know much about the Bible. And then the second thing I want you to pretend is that you don't really know how churches work. You know, and again, that might not be difficult for some of you. This may, for some of you, this is the only church you've ever really known. You uh, came here, maybe put your faith in Christ here. And others of you, you may, you may have been around for a while, so you know how churches work. So those are the two things I want you to pretend with me. Uh, just kind of, no matter where you're at spiritually, that you don't know very much about the Bible, that you don't know how churches work. And then uh, the story is, it's a fictional story, but it's about a church that's in trouble. It's a church... Uh, that we're calling uh, Oak Street Community Church, somewhere down south. And they've called me, and they've said, hey, we're in, we're in a difficult place, and would you, would you consult me? And I, I have so much on my plate, so I've asked you to do it for me. I've asked you to be the consultant, okay? So you've got to, you know, you don't know very much about the Bible, you don't know how churches work, then you've got to fantasize that you like me, that you'd be willing to do this for me. And you say, okay, Andy, I'll help you out. I'll consult this church that is in, that is in trouble. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the, 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 the story I want you to, to, to walk with me on. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this church. It's a beautiful little church. It's a little church, uh, but they have some great ministry going on. There's uh, a good, good Bible teaching. There's uh, a good teaching with the kids. There's mentoring from the older people to the, to the young people. There's uh, ministries, uh, compassion ministries to the poor, to the homeless. They're, they have ministries for married people, for singles. I mean, they have a lot of good stuff going on. <clears throat> but they're in trouble, and it's primarily financial trouble. Here's the reason. The pastor started this church about 10 years ago, and he had a friend who was very, very wealthy. He said, hey, I uh, will underwrite all of the finances for 10 years. I mean, wow, what a deal, right? Who wouldn't, who wouldn't take that? So pastor buys in on it. So over the last 10 years, they haven't had any teachings on giving. They've never passed an offering bag. They've never made a collection. There's been no gifts received. There was no need to. At the end of each month, they would just put all of their receipts in an envelope and mail it to this, uh, this wealthy guy, and he would just pay for it all. You just go, what's the problem? The problem is the 10 years is up. This uh, December 31st. The party's over come January 1st. All of a sudden, now they have all of this financial responsibility that they didn't have before. So the pastor's in a mild state of shock. The, ki the, the kids have heard rumors that the church might close. They're all uh, nervous and scared. Uh, the people in the church don't want their little church to close, and so that's why they've come to us. They've come to you and said, hey, help us out. We need some help. Now, they've guaranteed that whatever kind of counsel you give them, any kind of advice or guidance, they will do it. So that's good to know. They're going to do that. So, so that's kind of the situation. 
So <clears throat> what kind of advice would you give? What kind of, you know, what would be your best thinking on that? Well, uh, for me, I mean, I think we great minds think alike. I, here's kind of the things that I would think. I would think, first of all, I think, well, they need some money fast. I mean, January 30, uh, December 31st is coming hot and heavy. Uh, there's, they're going to need some money uh, short term. And so, you know, we got to come up with some money, some, sh some kind of uh, raising some money schemes. So I'd think, well, with Christmas around the corner, that maybe sell Christmas cookies, get some chocolate bunnies, and go to, you know, door to door selling chocolate bunnies uh, or chocolate Santas or something. Uh, I might think of like an all night bingo bash. All the proceeds go to the church. Or uh, maybe get the youth to do a, a walk a thon or a bike a thon or maybe a sleep a thon. Uh, you know, I don't know. The youth might like that, right? Uh, and uh, maybe do a lottery, kind of spiritualize it. You know, Trinity, pick three. You know, <laughs> just kind of, I'd be thinking, how can I come up with ways to raise money quickly? Because they're going to need some money. But <clears throat> before I got too deep into that, I think, well, let me first think about some numbers on that, you know, and let me, let me run some figures, both in the monetary terms as well as time terms. In monetary, I'd start to look at some of their bills and some of the, ex some of the things that it costs to operate a church. I'd realize, wow, they're going to have to sell a lot of pan pancakes in order to make this thing work. I mean, the kids are going to have to pack their bags to walk to Florida and back, you know. I mean, uh, I don't see it happening those kinds of schemes to get them through the, the difficult days of that church ahead. And then also with time. I mean, if we're not careful, we give them that kind of advice, these people are going to be giving their best time to raising money that really won't meet the needs of the church anyways, instead of doing the things that they're best at, using their gifts uh, serving the poor, ministering, praying for one another, worshiping, fellowshipping. These are the kinds of things that a church should be doing anyways. They're not even doing that. They're doing stuff that's kind of unrelated to the church. So I think, well, you know what? That's, that may not be really the best, the best pathway. But while I'm brainstorming, you know, think of some other things. Well, I think, well, maybe I could find, uh, maybe they could find another wealthy benefactor, right? Or maybe uh, they could apply for grants with, you know, some foundation, or maybe they can get money that way. Maybe they can get Trump to include it in the 2018 federal budget. That hasn't gone through the House yet, and uh, maybe he'll slip it in. But probably, I think, you know what? Those things don't look pretty likely, very likely. I probably need to come up with a different plan. And so pull out my tablet and roll up my sleeves and think, okay, what are some some honorable, inspiring ways to help them meet their financial obligations. You know, if I'm going to be a consultant, I've got to come up with some ways that really help them out. Not just in the immediate, but long term. So, what's the best path? Well, I would probably think, well, I'd want to tell them right up front that, hey, listen, uh, the main, the, one of the main things you want to get is that uh, Oak Street Community Church, I would like, if they would let me, I'd stand in front of them. I'd drive down there and stand and say, Oak Tree Community Church is you. It's, it's you. It's not the brick and mortar. It's, it's you. It's nobody else. It's you. But that's not the bad news. That's the good news. Because when everybody participates, when you get it that this is us, this is the church, then when you pull together and you all do something together, it builds there's power in unity. There's a sense of team spirit that gets built. It, it's like uh, there's a momentum and an excitement that we're all in this together. So I would, first of all, just say, listen, the main thing is, is every need, everybody needs to participate. That would be huge. That would be huge that all, everyone participates. And uh, there, the, everyone says, hey, I'm in. I'm not expecting somebody else to pull my weight. I'm going to be part of this. Now, be, in saying that, I would say that <clears throat> I would be careful to not, like, just take all the bills of Oak Tree Community Church and just divide them up equally and then just hand them out to, to individuals or families in the church. 
that doesn't sound right, just kind of like dues or, you know, a tax. Here it is. This is what the bill is. I mean, because some people obviously make more people more money than others. And so whenever you have, like, dues that are, not, that are due, this is, the, this is the fee, the haves get in and the have-nots don't, right? Which, I mean, there's dues when it comes to book clubs and health clubs and country clubs, and I guess it shouldn't, it's not the worst thing in the world if you don't end up getting in some book club or a particular health club or even a country club, and there's no reason to go home and cry about that. But it certainly seems criminal and wrong for these people, for some of them to not be able to belong to their church anymore because they couldn't afford the dues uh, that, that were set. So I, I would definitely shy away from that and say, you know what, I don't see that being a good mechanism, just you know, saying you know, these are the dues. Uh, I would probably look at more of a, uh, of a proportion, something scalable. People that make more money, they would pay more. People that make less money, they would pay less. So almost like a percentage or something, saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it. It's scaling so that everybody could participate, but everybody's kind of participating at an equal level. People that make more money are giving more. People making less uh, are giving less. Another reason I think that's so important is that that would build even more unity because everybody's participating in an equal way. They're all kind of in there saying, yeah, we're part of this. We're all sacrificing. We're all part of this. So I think that would be an important part, that some, something that's scalable so everybody could be part of that. Then I would say uh, I think it's important since the bills come in weekly and monthly, that the obligations to the poor, the obligations to, the, to uh, reaching the lost and uh, the salaries of the staff and, and the various uh, bills, uh, uh, utility bills and all those kinds of things, those come in pretty regularly. So I would say there would be need to be some kind of regularity to their giving. So I'd say everybody needs to participate, needs to be some kind of scaled way, you know, it's percentage or something. And then, and then, uh, and then everybody's consistent, just kind of like, in a regular way, okay, when, you know, when, when you get paid or something that would be regular. And there, here's the reason why is because human nature as it is, even if we have money earmarked for something like, let's say, okay, this is for the church, uh, then what happens is uh, we just, we get mission drift. We forget about it. And all of a sudden, uh, some, other, some other way of spending it happens. We either, you know, take a little getaway or, uh, you know, a new set of golf clubs, or we're watching TV and we see, you know, the, the, the salad shooter or the chia pet. And go, oh, man, I, I can't do without a, a chia pet or these knives or, you know, the tack light and these things that I have to have. And that's, you know, we've spent that money that we remarked here, over there. And then all three is, all three of those kind of, uh, those concepts are violated. I'm not participating. I'm not a, a, a proportional giver. I'm not consistent even though I had good intentions. So I would say consistency. Somehow I'd say, you know, consistency would be very important. And then I would say um, another thing that would be very important is that gi pro individual giving should be confidential. I mean, that just seems, weird things can happen when it comes to money. And th that's true in churches as well, that people that give a lot more might start feeling like major stockholders. They might, they might, uh, do some power plays and, and say, hey, you know, if I'm going to give this much, uh, I, wanna, I want my wife's picture to be on the front hallway, Edna, you know, with her, with her favorite verse underneath, you know, or I want valet parking. Or, so I would just say, nah, that's probably not a good plan. And the people that earn less and would then give less might feel like second-class citizens, even though they matter every bit as much to God and to the church. So I would, I'd say, well, I, I, I just think that it's really important, this idea of anonymity, you know, that private giving, what people give, is not public. I mean, certainly keep records, you know, for tax purposes and so forth, but, but it, that would not be something that would be, I just think that would break down unity instead of build it up. So I would say that would be important. So, you know, everybody plays a part, everybody participates, and there's some kind of proportional percentage there's consistency, there's a regularity to the giving. There's this aspect of privacy with an and anonymity with private donations. And then lastly, and I'm not sure how I would make this happen, but I would think somehow 
these people should be rewarded. I mean, they, they should be somehow acknowledged and encouraged. I mean, think about it. They're giving in this day and age when people are living by uh, very tight budgets and uh, the enormous cost of housing and transportation and college tuition and all of the expenses that, that, uh, that we incur. And these people are giving to God through the local church, but they're just on their, on their own free will. And in, in a society, in a world, I mean, we turn on the TV and there's people running people over in trucks and shooting people and, and there's the disintegration of the family and marriage breakdown. And, and I see the church as really the, one of the only institutions, if not the only one, that is really redeeming and restoring lives. I mean, the government isn't do redeeming and restoring lives. Business isn't redeeming and restoring lives. And uh, education isn't redeeming and restoring lives. It's the church that transforms the human heart, changes people from the inside out, changes everything, and they start to redeem their, their lives and changes them. And because of that, they're giving. Now, to me, they deserve a medal to be pinned on their chest. The, the, the problem is, I don't know how to do that while upholding this, uh, this thing of anonymity of giving. I mean, if you don't know what people are giving, how can you, how can you um, acknowledge them and encourage them? I don't have the answer to that. But I would, I would be up at night agonizing. How can I encourage people that are giving to help change not only our church, but our community our, and the world and really eternities. So that's, that's the kind of the five things. If I were going to consult to them, and I know great minds think alike, were you, is that kind of the vibe that you'd go with? I mean, is that, were you kind of tracking with me going, yeah, those are my five. You know, well, the, speaking of great minds, the Bible has some things to say about how a church should run. And it's intentional, intentional generosity. And, uh, and so I want to just real quickly look at what the Bible says, and it's on your outline if you want to follow along. There's five things uh, that go in that, the, that, and we see Jesus talking about this the, he, real briefly in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about the first three, and then uh, two other Bible authors speak of the other two. The first one is this full participation. Now notice Jesus says this. He says, when you give. He doesn't say if you give. He says when you give. And see, in Jesus' mind, he's, th he's thinking somebody who has been transformed by the love and the, and the grace of Jesus Christ is so uh, transformed that it transforms every part of them, including their wallet. And so it's not like if you give, if you happen to remember, and oh, it's the offering, and you throw in 10 bucks or something. No, he's saying when you give. He's talking about somebody who says, this is going to be part of what I do. This is part, this is, this is uh, part of my transformed life. In fact, the Bible would, would, would argue that, if, that if, if your wallet's not been converted, then you know, maybe your heart is not either. I mean, that we're integrated. It's, we're integrated. We're one way. I mean, there's, there's certainly... Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact everything in my life. Now, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 16. He says, on the first day of, the, of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. So here he says, he, he says, each one, every Christian should set aside. So he says, all of you are to participate. Not just some. It's not like some are supposed to be, you know, carrying the weight of the others. No, every single person, he says, setting aside a sum of money and uh, this is not for visitors that are checking out the church. This isn't for people that are, that are still uh, evaluating the claims of Christ. They're not even a Christian yet. No, this is for people that, this is, they say, this is my church. This is where I, I come and, and I serve. Now, Jesus said this. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's saying that, you know, we're a package deal. And so, and, and, and we're wired that where our heart is, we're going to have our finances follow in that area. That's, that we're all like that. Anything that we're totally uh, uh, in love with, that, we're, we're, that we think about, that we're consumed with, is something that we're passionate about, money flows in that same direction. He goes, there's no difference with that and with your spirituality. If God has transformed your life 
If, he's, if, 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 if you realize, hey, I was in a mountain of moral indebtedness that I couldn't get out of, Jesus died on the cross for me, that he released from me, released that from me, I have a clear conscience, I have an eternity ahead of me, I have power for living, I have the grace of God operating in my life to be able to forgive, to be able to, to get up and have power to live each day, to, to be able to see trans, uh, transformative uh, principles in my workplace, in my home life. And then so he's just saying, naturally, uh, you're going you're gonna to be impassioned about that financially as well. Okay, so the Bible says, as all throughout, I just pointed out a few, it says everybody participates. Now, some of you, are, are there, you're, you're participators. Others of you, uh, that's, uh, you're not there yet. And I invite you, you know, first weekend of November, 2070, to say, you know what? This is my church and I'm gonna participate. Uh, it's, it's not okay to just be on the sidelines. I don't expect other people to pick up my expenses. I wanna be part of this. And so I invite you to be part of that. The second thing is this, that God's word talks about that it should be a proportion. Notice it says, every Sunday, each of you must put aside some money in proportion to what you have earned and save it up so that there will be no need to collect money when I come. So Paul's saying, you know, that each person, they should in proportion think through, okay, I'm going to give, and, uh, and here's the amount I'm going to give. And, the, and it's not a levy. It's not a due. It's not, it's not a tax. It's a proportion. And the New Testament, as well as Old Testament, talks about this percentage or this proportion, which is 10%. Notice in Leviticus, it says, a tenth of all you produce is the Lord's, and it is holy. And then Jesus says in Luke 11, but woe to you, Pharisees, for though you are careful to tithe even the smallest part of your income, you completely forgot about justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but you should not leave these other things undone. undone. So now, those of you who know the Bible know that the New Testament does not emphasize uh, the tenth, the percentage as much as the Old Testament, but it doesn't rescind it either. But the New Testament is talking about giving a proportion amount, and when you look in the, you know, the Acts of the Apostles, and the, it's, it's talking about giving our whole lives. And so really, the 10% is the minimum. It says, yeah, certainly there's a minimum. And in the Old Testament, if you calculated up all the expectations on, uh, on, on, on uh, the Israelites, with the temple tax and the tithe and the Levite tax and, and the various libation offerings. I mean, it ended up being about 23%. But 10% is, 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 is laid out as kind of this is uh, the tithe that is tied to, uh, to the expectations of what it is for, for uh, a follower of God to give. And so giving this proportion is important. And, and the Bible talks about it. Now, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but obviously, if, if, uh, if we're giving part of that proportion to other causes, noble and good causes, you know, charities and, you know, the King's Daughters and, and United Way and Christian Radio and not giving it to the local church, then obviously that, just like with Oak Street Community Church, that becomes more the, more the problem than the solution. So certainly an important part of it is saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a, a participant and I'm going to be a, a percentage or proportional giver. And, and that's true with online. We have as many people, actually we have more people watching online than we have that come to our services. And so somebody could watch online and say, hey, since I'm not actually there, I don't have to give at all. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right either. I mean, it sounds like if this is part of the place where you're getting fed, the community you get, that you're connected into, you would, you would play a role and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give a proportion or a percentage. And as, notice what uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says. So let each, and there's the participation part again, let each one of us purpose in his heart, not <coughs> grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I love this verse because it says here that you should never give under pressure. When you're, especially when you're giving to God. You should never give. It's just the wrong attitude. You should never give under pressure. So certainly that would not be something I would want to be communicating now. I mean, we've all, uh, if, if you're like me, we've all experienced, you know, seeing on TV, somebody, 
you know, pointing their finger and making me feel pressured and, you know, and trying to manipulate me or I get something in the mail and it's underlined in blue and shaming me. We're going under if you don't help us. And the Bible says you should never give under pressure. Never give begrudgingly, under compulsion. It should always be planned, thoughtful. It should be joyful. It should be cheerful. This is an important part. In fact, that Greek word in there talks, it's hilarion, which is where we get our word hilarious. And it's this idea of just a, a joyful. And joyful because it's the motive. God has done something amazing in my life. I want to participate in what God is doing in the world. And so this is, this is uh, something that always should be uh, in your giving, is giving joyfully, giving joyfully. I love that, not under pressure. And then the th this next one, the principle of consistency. Notice what he says here. Paul says this. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do on the first day of every week. So circle that, every week. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that, I will, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So every week. It's not a legalistic every week. It's just every week is... is uh, means it's built into your pattern. Again, it's this idea of planning it out, saying, I'm thoughtful about this, and I want to I wanna participate in this, and, uh, and, and which is real easy today because there's online checking, there's auto automatic withdrawal, there's automatic uh, online checking. There's lots of options so that if somebody's not there, obviously the, the expenses stay the same. So if, if for some reason we're not there or a hurricane happens, you know, then uh, it, we're consistent with that. The Bible says, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill the barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. So here's this idea, again, of consistency. The first part of your, of your income, I'm thinking it through, God, your first place in my life, and I'm going to demonstrate that in how I spend my time, how I spend my energy, how I spend my money. Now, I put this next verse in there because it's a motivational verse because when it comes to consistency, you know, God is consistent to us in his love for us and his kindness towards us. And so one of the things that helps motivate me is to remind myself, God, you're consistent to me in, your, in, your, in, in how you respond and, faithful, and faithfully respond to me. And so I want to be that way with you. It says, the unfailing love of the Lord never ends. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. And then the principle of anonymity. Now, this is a sensitive issue when it comes to money. And it, if we're not careful, it can cause harm. And so notice what James talks about. He says, dear brothers, how can you claim that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, if you show favoritism to rich people and look down on poor people? If you make a lot of fuss over a rich man and give him the best seat in the house and say to the poor man, you can stand over there if you like or sit on the floor, well, judging a man by his wealth shows that you are guided by wrong motives. So the Bible is very clear uh, that we should not uh, do any grand grandstanding, that we, we don't hold a press conference. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, that, that it should be done between us and God. And so it can do some weird stuff if we start doing, you know, you know these power plays. Now, I'm so thankful. Sharon and I started this church uh, uh, 23 years ago. And over that entire time, I can't think ever, where somebody who had more disposable income tried to do some kind of power play. They never said, hey, uh, we'll hop out with the, you know, the building project if we can put our wife, Edna, you know, my wife's you know, picture up there. Or I can get this, you know, you know, special privileges. We've never had that, and I'm thankful for that, which says to me that you, Vineyard, you're giving for the right motives. I mean, when you, that's part of a motive check is that we can give with, with, without recognition, without fanfare, and, w and, we, and, and we're all part of it. We're all giving a percentage. We're giving consistently, but we're giving, jo and giving joyfully. And to me, that says a lot about the motives when we can give without, with, without recognition like that. And then lastly is this principle of encouragement, which I think is so important. As I said earlier, that would be the, the advice I would give to, uh, to the Oak Street Community Church down south is that, hey, this, this is heroic sacrifices, generous, uh, no recognition. Th they, have, th they have bills and budgets and challenges, and yet through all of that, 
they've prioritized extending the kingdom of God, doing ministry in our culture, helping win people to Christ, repairing broken families, helping people out of addictions, with all the opioid crisis and the drug abuse and all of the, the, uh, the STDs and just the, the society is, is, it has just wave after wave of brokenness that, that comes up. And we're like, we're standing in the fray of that saying, no, we're gonna do something. I, to me, that, that's heroic. And I would, I, to me, I would, I, I would just do whatever I can to try to find encouragement for them. However, uh, th- with anonymity, it just can't happen, right? I, we can't do it. I can't do it. But the good news is God says he does it. He does the encouragement. He does the reward. Notice this last verse on your outline. Now, Malachi is talking to a nation that has fallen away from giving. They've missed all of these, all five. And so he's challenging them, but I want you just to drop down to verse 10, because he says this, I am the Lord, there in Malachi 3, verse 10, he says, I am the Lord all-powerful, and I challenge you to put me to the test. Bring the entire 10% into the storehouse, not other charities or causes or Christian TV, to, to the, he says, to the storehouse, so there will be food in my house. Then I will open the windows of heaven and flood you with blessing after blessing. So God says, he is the one who recognizes when we give faithfully like that, when we're participating, when we're giving a percentage. He says, when you give 10%, all of a sudden, kind of, God puts his hand on your finances. And, and, and he says that blessing after blessing, in other words, there's some kind of divine interaction that starts to happen when we start to trust God. And the principle is simple. Whatever we want God to bless, we put him first in that area. And we say, God, I want you to bless this. And then watch what God does. Now, if, you're, if you don't know Christ and you've come here and you've heard this message, um, I'm glad. I'm glad because you should know what is expected of you when you put your faith in Christ, including your finances. I mean, and so now you know that we'll never ask you to you know, if you become a Christ follower and this is your church, we'll never ask you to go stand on the street corner or at the airport with the tin cup, you know, asking for donations. We're not going to do that. We're not going to ask you to sign over your title to your house or your car because we have a, you know, we have a crisis in the church. Or we, we're not going to do that. We're not going to take multiple offerings to put a lot of pressure on you. We're not going to do that. We're just... We're going we're gonna to do God's, God's way. He says, hey, there's a pathway. It's a way to do that. So that would be good for you to know. For me, over the years, especially during some of the times when we bought the building and did some big renovations, Sharon and I have given in some pretty dramatic ways, and we've never been recognized for that. And I'm okay with that. I wouldn't want it any other way. But I also have never felt used by uh, board members or leaders in the church. I've never take, felt like I was taken advantage of, even if, you know, the church uh, seemed like they were fixing something that didn't need to be fixed, it wasn't broken, or I wasn't totally on board with something, or, uh, you know, the church, even though the, the church was meeting its budget or blowing past its budget. See, I made a commitment years ago when I put my faith in Christ I made a commitment. I thought, you know what? It's between you and me, God. I'm going to participate in your kingdom work. I'm gonna, it's just, I'm going to, it's not based on other people's behavior. Whatever church you have me in, and right now it's Vineyard, whatever church you have me in, I'm going to be a participator. I'm going to be somebody who gives a proportion. It's not going to change. It's going to go. Actually, it's gone up for Sharon and I. Each year, we've always challenged ourselves. Let's, let's, let's give more. Let's, let's be living in faith and, and believe that God will reward us and see it. And he has. Here's what I've discovered, though. See, for me, it was a decision. And what I've discovered is, is that every person who gets out of the grandstand of just watching and gets onto the playing fields and says, I'm going to participate. I'm going to be a player. I'm going to start giving. Per, I'm going to participate. I'm going I'm to give uh, a proportion consistently, generously, joyfully nobody ever drifts there nobody ever just kind of wanders into that space 
they always make a decision. This is true all the way back from ancient times to today. It's always a decision that says, kind of you draw a line in the sand and you say, today is the day I'm going to move over. Everybody has done. That's how they get there. It's a decision. And for some of you, that's your decision. You are on one side and you're looking at it and you're saying, you know, yeah, that's not me. I'm not participating. I'm not, I'm not doing my fair share. This is my church, but I'm not consistent. And this is the day f- that I'm asking you, would you pray about it? Say, God, I want to be on the other side. I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be a participant. I'm going to be part of this. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, for more of you, Lord. When we sing and we reflect on your word, it opens our eyes. Lord, I pray that you open the eyes of our heart. For some here, if you have never come to Christ, you've never put your faith in Christ, (coughs) God invites you into his presence with open arms. You say, Lord, I want to follow you. I I want what you have to give the clean conscience, the power for living. Help me, Lord. Would you say, God, forgive me for trying to do it my own way. Today, Lord, I'm going to rely on you. And then for all of you who uh, call this your church home, you're fed here, whether you're online or whether you're here in, in body. You say, God, help me to be a participant. I'm getting out of the grandstands today. I'm going to get on the playing field. I'm going to be a percentage or proportional giver. I'm going to be consistent and joyful and generous. And Lord, I trust that what I do in private, you will reward and you will see. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.